Welcome to another video. So far, I have covered some of my favorite and iconic adventures from 2nd, 3rd and 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. I traversed the world building waters with some help from Greek mythology and philosophy and added some videos for Game Master inspiration here and there. I think it's time for me to make a series of videos for a game that is near and dear to my heart, taking a pause from my beloved Dungeons and Dragons momentarily. A game that whenever I feel depleted of imagination or starting to feel burned out from my weekly D&D games, reading its lore recalibrates me instantly. It has that magical pull as Tolkien has with his books. When I read them, I am instantly being reverted back to my all-loving fantasy mode on. And this game is none other than Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I'm not going to stick to editions because each of them had something to give to the game, even third edition in my eyes. But the theme, the setting, the stories you can find in endless amounts of books is staggering. I know for a fact that when I want to be on my fantasy world ready to create stuff, I always pick a Godric and Felix novel. Reading one more short story and I'm ready to kick ass and take names. But excluding the beautiful lore that we eventually are going to see some of it here in the channel, this game and particularly second edition is close to my heart because it was the last session I had with my school buddies ever. The last time we rolled dice together, almost a decade ago. The same group we started playing D&D back in the 90s, the same group we have played an ungodly amount of hours, those characters we were breathing, dreaming and living through them for all those years back. Eventually life happened, families, work, people moved away. The group remained friends, but no more brothers in arms. So this video is dedicated to those brothers. But to talk about Warhammer is to talk about the greatest and most difficult adventures to run that was ever written in any role-playing game. The Enemy Within. And what better time to delve into that colossal attempt of breaking down than now, when Cubicle 7 is so close in finalizing their amazing rework and reprint of the series for 4th edition Warhammer Fantasy. So, with no further ado, this is the first part of a very long series. The Enemy Within. I will be using the new print of the book to do my review for no particular reason other than that I feel it's a great work from Cubicle 7 and I really want them to move on with the publications they have already done in the Warhammer universe. Their books, artworks, stories are a gem in my library, but a huge thanks goes out to them for picking up the IP and moving ahead with some awesome stories and new books. But this review will be infused with the many rounds I have made with the second edition rule set and the first edition original story. Now that all the pleasantries and introductions are out of the way, let's start with the synopsis of the first book of Enemy Within, Enemy in Shadows. The story has two parts that are divided into chapters 1 to 4, used to be called Mistaken Identity, and chapters 5 to 9 used to be called Shadows over Bogenhafen. On their way to Aldorf, the group of adventurers stumble upon a group of mutants that have already attacked and killed the occupants of another unfortunate coat. Among their passengers, Castor Liberan a person that looks exactly like one of your adventurers. In his pockets, paperwork that asks him to go to the city of Bogenhafen and claim the inheritance of mythic proportions. What the players do not know is that Castor is a cultist and that he has been lured to Bogenhafen by a bounty hunter with a ruse of a heritage that does not exist. Arriving at the city of Aldorf, a mid-stop before their destination, they're gonna be bombarded by a barrage of weird encounters by Castor's fellow cultists and adventurers will be drawn into a story much deeper than they hoped for. Meeting a large cast of NPCs, some hostile, some friendly, the players will be tailed by the cult list that think that Castor wants to keep the money for himself and become suspicious and unsettled, while Kufto, the bounty hunter, will start taking them out of the picture, preparing to make his move for Castor, their ranking officer. On their second intermediate stop in Weisbrook, while they lend a helping hand to Joseph, a friend they have met in Aldorf, to head to Bogenhafen for the festival, the group will be ambushed by the hunter. Overcoming him will lead them to Bogenhafen that will find out that the whole thing is a ruse, but they're going to find themselves in the middle of a much more dangerous and deadly story. On this second part, the group will locate proof of a cult working in the city. They will uncover a hidden temple with demonic creatures and slowly they will uncover a group of merchants that are being manipulated by their cultist leader and a demon that has sold his soul to. Now, the time has come for the demon to collect, he is promising the lives of his fellow merchants in exchange. Unbeknownst to him, the demon will claim all the souls of the city of Bogenhafen by opening a chaos gate if the ritual is complete. 
Now the players will have to fight not only for their lives, but for the life of the Empire. This video will be the first part covering the mistaken identity plotline of Book 1, The Enemy in Shadows. In order to build some solid foundations of understanding this adventure, we are going to delve to some background of the major pillars that it has. The Order of the Purple Hand is one of the many chaos cults that exist in the Empire. Their goal is to infiltrate key positions of power and control the puppets from the inside. They have already placed people in the cult of Sigmar and Ulrich and plan to spread religious chaos, hoping that having the two major religious powers at its other's throat will create an unstabling balance that will set the Empire to civil war. Losing their two pillars of protection against chaos, even momentarily, will be enough for the ruinous powers to do the dirty work and setting the ground for the incursion from the north. A little bit about Castro Liberan. He was a member of the Purple Hand for most of his life. He rose to power within a known cell of Chaos Cult. He became a Manchester Impedimetae, having to acquire whatever the cult required by any means necessary. Kidnapping people for the sacrificial needs of the cult was one of those needs. On a botched kidnapping attempt, another cultist was imprisoned and under torture gave the title of Castor, making him flee known for Minheim, fearing for his safety. Of course, sooner rather later, he managed to join another cell and continue his involvement in the cult with his ambitions always in heart. Back in Nuln, trying to find who the Magister was, a huge bounty was set on his head, with many bounty hunters taking up the job. One of those was Adolphus Kufzo, and he succeeded to infiltrate the lower level of the Hand and learn about the trail of the Magister. Heading to Aldorf to research in depth the Hand, Adolphus managed to get a name, Castor Liberan. Now his plan for flushing out the Magister began, setting up a wild scheme with ludicrous inheritance, including a small estate with a minor title. A letter was sent to Castor's last known address in Nuln, directing him into a trap in the market town of Bogenhafen. His letter was forwarded to him in Middenheim, and he instantly set out to claim this amazing treasure. The cult, having the money and the power of Castor's, would propel their plans to disrupt the Empire. He was instructed to make contact with the members of the Purple Hand in Aldorf's cell, who were ready to hunt him any necessary assistance and collect their fees. Of course, for our adventure to start, Castor never made it to Aldorf. He was slain by mutants in their way, when his coach was attacked. The body is waiting to be discovered by the characters, one of whom has an uncanny resemblance to the cultist. So the double inherits the problems along with wealth and ennoblement. Adolphus is waiting in Aldorf to pick up the trail of the cult, acting on the information he has gathered. He has located and staked out the members of the cell of the Hand in the city, waiting for the Magister to arrive. Once he sees the members of the cult approaching someone from out of town, he will make his move and try to kill him. In the meantime, the professor that gave the information to Adolphus, along with the people that already hired him, will continue to seek out who the Magister is, even if the hunter is dead. Of course, the bounty hunter is not the only problem the double will have. If he fails to make contact with the members of the hand, they will think that he went rogue and that he is planning to betray the cult now that he became rich and powerful, leading into making more enemies hidden in the shadows. The initial plot from the first book, Mistaken Identity, worked just fine for many of my groups. The old adventurers needed post. The group must head to Aldorf to become members of a great expedition to the Grey Mountains. And they later all find out that they missed it and that the prince has already left. As always, the best way for your party to connect will be to have a session zero. Let your players make characters and then simply ask them why they want to get to the Great Capital, the center of the Empire. Binding the stories of the players at the start of a grand adventure is always the way to go. Have them share an interesting encounter before they get into the road together. The Companion, a supplementary book of Cubicle 7 they have published along with the initial adventure, has some pretty decent hooks that can be used at specific parts of the adventures. The In Media Flea from page 43 is a great starter, setting up a good encounter for your players to test drive their new characters and at the same time introduce the mystery that the lookalike will have later on. 
people calling her Liberan, one of your players, and saving him from wardens that want to arrest him for crimes against the Empire will definitely create some interesting RP moments for your group. Also helpful might be the NPCs that they are showcased in the Companion. The adventure down the line has some weak points of progressing the story, setting up a weave of interesting encounters beforehand that can come up later and secure those points is the way to go. So a friend in need encounter from page 88 of the Companion with a merchant that has been murdered and his ghost that seeks redemption by burial from the party is a minor plot but can provide with solid help in the later parts of the adventure. I will come back in part 2 of this adventure for more details but let's just say that the plot progression of a campaign must never, never depend on a paper falling off a pocket of an NPC. The Coaches and Horses is the starting inn. Two days away from Aldorf, coaching inns exist throughout the Empire, they serve as a safe pit stop for travelers and adventurers. Road wardens use them as bases while they patrol the roads, and of course can be used as strongholds in case of unrest, since they are walled and decently protected. In one of my second edition games, that actually became a court of law, because some road wardens were the judges of a little situation that my players created. So here we have a beautifully laid out inn that can work for your future games easily. And that's a note that's really important, the value of those books is top notch. I'm not sponsored by Cubicle 7, I promise, but I have to give it to them. They give materials that you can use them for years to come. Hooks, plots, NPCs, beautiful maps, locations and everything in between. So, well done, keep it up. We can see that the map and the detailed analysis of its location here. Having this starting place, it would be a waste not to set up something explosive for your players to bond. A haste gone wrong, an assassination, a kidnapping, a manifestation of chaos, anything to build the strong foundation this story needs for your players to delve into the hard and dirty stories of this world. In page 18, the writers of the adventure give up three really fun hooks for this kind of initial encounters. The bandit's trouble, where the bandman is in cahoots with the bandits, scouting his customers and giving out information for their valuables. It's a solid start. Or even if the drivers of the coats are bandits in disguise, readying an ambush for a rich group as your players. The runaway, uh, where Lady Isolde, which is one of the nobles that travel with the players towards Aldorf, is a runaway from her family for political reasons, and her brother bursts in the inn with the bands of thugs to take her back home by force, the lady pleading for the help of the players. The coach that will leave for Aldorf in the morning is already parked here, and the passengers and coachmen relax inside the inn. There is a plethora of interesting NPCs that the players can interact with, from noble-born ladies to cheating gamblers and hidden delvers of the dark arts. Interaction at this point is free for all, and based on your characters might lead you anywhere. If not for a great RP opportunity with your newly created players, the group will have the chance to fish out a great amount of rumors to start picking their interest. Heading out from the inn and taking the road to Aldorf, the adventure really begins with a scene of destruction being met on the road. A coach blocking their way and a mute and attacking them. Among the dead, the players will find Castor's body. And in his pocket, the paperwork informing him that there is a huge heritage awaiting him in Bogenhafen. To their surprise, he is looking exactly like one of your players. This is a great moment to talk about the new options Cubicle 7 gives through this book for the players. Since Enemy Within is a really famous and played adventure, game masters as me who have played them with many groups, we're gonna have to stumble upon the major problem of the players know the story. So they managed to pull off a great addition to the series with many extra tidbits and twists that take what is expected by the players and turn it on its head. Those boxes are called Grognard boxes. For example, we all expect a mutant ambush at the start of the first chapter, the coach to be attacked by the same mutant Rolf and the wardens to arrive and take us to Aldorf. Some of the new twists that we introduce here are the bandits connected with the initial encounter where the bartender is part of a bandit group and they're making some kind of an ambush, killing the unfortunate Liberan and now it's the time for the players. Don't I Know You, another great twist with Castor being alive and being encountered with some of his fellow cultists that they are being caught red-handed into the forest, leaving them no option than attacking your players, inevitably killing them all and later on finding out that this person looks exactly like one of your adventurers and he is having some waiting wealth coming his way. What a great opportunity for your players to take. 
And finally, the Ratmen. Uh, Ratmen play a great part from Book 2 onwards. Instead of having just the paperwork, Castor has with him a small warp stone, and Ratmen are just hunting him. The rats will kill him, and the groups will intervene, and they will have a fight with Ratmen that they're going to disappear in the darkness with a small chest of the dead men in, in their hands. So all kinds of different twists that make this adventure new for returning players that they have played it again and again in the past. Moving on with the encounter, the players will find a camp of mutants that is just at the side of the road. Four mutants are having a feast with the dead of the unfortunate Coats. Managing to kill the threat the players will have to deal with the incoming wardens. It's always a great scene to see how your players are going to react. Are they going to try to hide the lookalike? Are they going to run for it? Are they going to try to find an elaborate excuse? It's always fun to see how surprised players react. Sooner or later, they will find themselves in Aldorf, in a living city that is filled with great images, sounds and experiences for your players. Spending the time to make your players see why Aldorf is such a huge place is the way to go. Along with the help of the supplementary books, such as the City of Sigmar for 4th edition, or the Spires of Aldorf, the second part of Paths of the Damned for 2nd edition, you will find plenty of information and inspiration to enrich your sessions. One of the first things the party will do if they follow the initial hook is to head to the Prince Tassinik to see what is the status of the expedition. Finding out that the Enturads has already left and they are late to the party, it's a good thing that they have a huge heritage to claim. The members of the Purple Hand will make their attempt to communicate with Castor when they feel comfortable. They will approach him and they will start a sequence of nonsensical hand gestures that your players will obviously have no way to respond. Repeating this failed attempt to talk with the Magister, the cult members will start to become suspicious and worried that Castor wants to avoid them and keep the money for himself, making them soon enraged and dangerous. Adding to the equation a mysterious man that the players will start seeing watching over those encounters with a cultist and you have a formula for success. That man is the bounty hunter Adolfo Kufzo, that he's staking out the members of the hand to see who Castor is. It is time though for a friendly face to make his appearance, an old friend of a member of the group, a boatman named Joseph. Having any players with careers that are relevant with traders, boatmen, seamen or rivermen in general fit perfectly to establish a close and trustworthy relationship with Joseph. He is a great source of information and he has an integral part of moving on the flow of the adventure. He is planning to head to Bogenhafen for the great festival and he will take his friend out to the street of a hundred taverns to catch up. When the players find themselves in the boatman's inn, the second important encounter will unfold. First Joseph will tell them about Sahenfest and invites them to help him out if they want to. But also a man in black called Max will enter the inn eyeballing the players and having everyone else being obviously afraid of him. A short while after Max, a couple of young nobles with the escort of four massive bodyguards will enter the establishment. They are going to be provoking everyone and anyone, especially your players, making sure to insult and degrade them as much as possible, effectively making a brawl inevitable. At which point Max will interfere and will intimidate if not attack your players. After the fight, the nobles with their bodyguards will leave the inn amused by the whole thing and if Max is killed, some patrons of the inn will thank the players kicking his body into the river, ensuring them that no one will find about it. If Max is not being killed, he is going to leave the establishment and the players can take the fight to him later on if they want to, but of course they will not gain any admiration from the dock workers. Heading to the Berebelli, Joseph's boat, for the night, the players might notice that they are being followed. They finally see two cultists, those that tried to communicate with them earlier, being killed by bolts in front of them. One of them receives the bolt in the back of his head, while the other one, turning to see what happened, takes it in the throat. On their bodies, tattoos of a purple hand can be found, if searched in depth, linking them to the cult. That will lead us into the fourth chapter of the adventure on to Bogenhafen where the players will find out that a murder has taken place in Aldorf. Two nobles have been murdered. The same nobles that they were having the altercation last night, as it seems, did not stop their hazing and their endless drinking, and of course the faces of your players will start to pop out on posters around the city as wanted for murder. Later on, of course, the real culprits will be apprehended, so your player's name will be cleared out, but at this point they will have to feel the pressure of leaving Aldorf as fast as possible. 
A great RP moment is when the Beribelli exits Aldorf on its way to Weisbrock, where a group of wardens will be galloping on the side of the river trying to stop the boat. This patrol is there just to warn the boatmen of bandits up ahead. But the players, given the status they left Aldorf, might do all kinds of crazy things. Really fun and underrated encounter, with so many different endings. Weisbrook is a small town of the river Bogen. It is predominantly a merchant town. Here the players will see again the same stocky shadowy man on the doorway of the Black Gold Inn. This is of course Adolfo Kufta. He is watching Berbelli dock and now the players can identify the crossbow that he is obviously carrying. If the players try to reach him, he will head inside the inn. If followed, they will find out that he slipped out on the back door. Investigating might bring your player some more information about the when he arrived and where in the city he is currently staying. Now the players either will stick to the city trying to find out who he is or they will head to Bogenhafen. If they head for Kufto, they will find him at the Trumpet Inn conversing with three thugs. He is instructing one of them to scout the Berebelli and inform him if it leaves and the other two are instructed to meet him later on. If he's followed, he will make sure to avoid conflict unless he has the upper hand and picks a character alone to kill him fast. His plan is to attack on the Berry Belly while it is tied on the dock during the night and provide the group of a really amazing encounter. While most of them are asleep, the thugs and Kufcho will try to take out the guards fast and silently and cover the chimneys of the boat with buckets to make sure that the smoke will stay in sight. Pots of burning oil will be thrown by the thugs on the exit points, trapping the people inside. Readying their ranged weapons, they will pick any character trying to escape with their lives. A really fast-paced and intense encounter that I really enjoy playing. While the fight takes place, Joseph and his crew of two will try to put up the fires and cast off the dock. This will take them from 6 to 20 rounds. Killing Kuftil, the players will find a letter on him and a sketch representing Castor. If he survives the attack, he will try to head to Bogenhafen for his final attempt on the life of the Magister. The alternative storylines from Cubicle 7 have a couple of interesting things to offer. Among others, in Wastebrook, Kufto might set a trap for the players. Seeing him in the inn and trying to follow him, he will lead them into his room, which will be booby-trapped in various ways and ambushed by many thugs. A great twist for the grognards that know the story. Or, if they are fortifying the boat, an anonymous tip by the bounty hunter that dangerous bandits that are preparing their boat for a campaign of piracy out of the dock, having the authorities come for them when they might expect an ambush by the Kuftso is a fun way to mess with the minds of your players, especially if the word has come out from Aldorf that they are wanted. Fighting the letter, the players will safely find out that the man's name is Adolfo Kuftso and that he is a well-respected bounty hunter. He was on the trail of someone with the title Magister Impedimitae and that the Magister's name is Castor Liberan. He was traveling from Aldorf to Middenheim and his bolts are the same that they killed the two men in Aldorf. If they have found the tattoos on the victims, they might conclude that this is the sign of the unnamed society. And that will be the end of this first part, the mistaken identity. The players will be heading towards Borgenhafen, ready to fall into deeper waters than they ever expected. They have plenty to investigate and seek out, depending on their choices and deductions. Thanks for being here, I really appreciate it, especially now that I'm so close to hit my 1000 mark. I really have no words to thank you for all your support, and I really apologize for the delay on my videos. Life gets in the way, I guess. I will make sure to prepare something good to celebrate that. Hit me up with ideas of what you want to see in the comments down below. Until then, this was the RPG Lore Master and welcome to my cultist infested table.